So I'm going to give a summary of what anonymous communications are, why you might care about them, um, and also what me and colleagues have learnt on the Tor project in actually trying to get this technology rolled out in the real world. So first of all, if we have a look at why people might actually want anonymity, well, the, the sorts of people who need this are, um, for example, military personnel. The TOR project was originally started as a, a US Navy research labs project, and what they were concerned about was, firstly, um, open intelligence gathering. So they wanted to look at websites run by criminals or run by terrorists and try to examine what's going on. Um, and they're also concerned about protecting military personnel in the field. They wanted to make sure that someone who is conducting surveillance wouldn't be able to say that this person works for the US military or this person is the admiral. This is the person that you should kidnap. Law enforcement has very similar needs. You might have undercover agents who are going to communicate back with their home base. Um, but also bloggers. If you're um, working in a, a trade union in a company town and you want to express your views in a blog, then if you do this under your real name, you might find, find yourself being fired or um, being the recipient of intimidation. If on the other hand, you're anonymous, you've got greater freedom for talking about the things that you actually care about. Um, similarly, activists. Sometimes these people want to be very public, express what they're doing in their organization, but if they're working in a hostile environment, um, I suppose that it's a, a country with a bad human rights record, then they might want to protect themselves by disguising their identity, um, and they particularly might want to disguise their sources. Journalists have similar requirements here. And also ordinary people. Many people get frustrated by advertisements showing up, showing them the things that they've been searching for. If you try to buy a present for someone in your house and then they log onto your computer and they see lots of pictures of that, then that is quite frustrating and you can use tools to protect your anonymity in order to avoid these sorts of annoying behaviors. Um, but we've already got encryption. So we've got encrypted email, we've got encrypted web browsing, so why can't we just use that? Well, basically the encryption doesn't work for the purposes that many people need. Let's suppose that we're assuming that encryption is all working perfectly, software doesn't have bugs being used correctly, and then we see that someone called Alice has uploaded a gigabyte of encrypted traffic to CNN six hours before some human rights abuse footage is shown. Probably Alice is the person who uploaded that. So if you're working at the ISP of a country which is trying to repress human rights, encryption did not protect Alice. Um, on the other hand, if you're the sysadmin for a criminal organization and you see that one of your members sends an encrypted email to the FBI before, um, a week before the boss got arrested, then this is probably the FBI informant. Maybe they're an FBI agent or maybe they've been um, coerced by the FBI into giving information. So that's the person who's probably going to get his kneecaps broken. And if you, um, you're Charlie and you're a system in for a website that is hosting illegal content and you keep on seeing regular requests from a police computer, then why not give that police computer some fake data? Pretend that you're not doing anything illegal. Give everyone else the real stuff. Again, encryption is not going to protect the police in this case because even though the communication is going to be encrypted, the address of where you're coming from, where you're going to, how much you're sending, and how often is not going to be hidden. So you need to use encryption, but you also need some sort of anonymous communication technology to protect against the scenarios that are being described here. The first type of anonymous communication technology was to do with email. And these were collectively known as remailers. The simplest one of them was the um, penet.fi, run out of Finland. And this was very simple. All that it did was it would take a e specially formatted email in, 
And in that specially formatted email, you would have inside the body of the email the address that you really want to send this email to, and then you send it to pennet.fi. The headers will be stripped off this email, and then the new to address gets substituted, and then this email goes on to the full destination. The recipient of that email now sees an email coming from this remailer, but isn't able to find out the email address that it originally came from. The other feature that this system had is it kept track of which incoming address corresponded to which outgoing address, which meant that if the anonymous recipient of this email sent a reply back to the remailer, the remailer would do the same trick in reverse and then send this on to the original recipient. And so you could have conversations going on, but with one person in the conversation not having to give up their identity. So this was quite popular, but it had the big weakness that you had this single point of failure. You had one computer run by one person which had a database of incoming email addresses and outgoing email addresses. And as a result, it became quite a tempting target for compromise. There were at least two compromises, but the one which triggered the shutdown of the website was when a court order by the Church of Scientology forced the operator of this website to disclose the identity of someone who was campaigning against the Church of Scientology. And we never know what happened to that person, but the operator of the website knew that it was no longer safe to run it, and then in 1996, it was shut down. But the, this is not the only vulnerability that these simple remailers have. The other one is that there's no encryption involved. So someone who is looking at messages coming in and going out of this remailer is trivially able to work out who's communicating with whom. And that's what led to one of the successor systems, um, sometimes called type one remailers, sometimes called, called cypherpunk remailers. And this works on a similar principle, but it also incorporates encryption. So here we've got two people, Alice and Bob, and they're going to send the message to Charlie and Dave. So Alice wants to send up here a message to Dave. Bob wants to send a message to Charlie. So Alice takes her message, and then on top of the message, she puts Dee's address, and then encrypts the whole thing under the public key of this mix. Bob does a similar trick, puts Charlie's address at the top, and encrypts the whole thing under the public key of the mix. Someone who is observing at this point is able to see that two encrypted messages are coming in. They're able to see that it's from Alice and from Bob, but they're not able to see this address because it's encrypted. But the mix can. The mix has the corresponding private key. It can decrypt these messages and then send them on to the correct destination. So this is a, a good start. It means that someone observing isn't able to trivially work out who's communicating with whom, but it still has the vulnerability that the mix is able to know that Alice is talking to Dave and Bob is talking to Charlie. And so if that mix is compromised, is the subject of legal challenges, then the user's privacy is going to be violated. So that brought us on to the successor system, Mixmaster. Mixmaster still exists. And rather than just using one layer of encryption, it uses multiple layers. Here's the similar graph here. So Alice is talking to Charlie, Bob is talking to Dave. So Alice takes her message, puts Charlie's address on it, and then encrypts it under the public key of Mix3. But now, rather than stopping here, Alice takes this message, puts Mix3's address on here, and then encrypts it under the public key of Mix1. So now this message goes to Mix1. One layer of encryption is removed, and then Mix1 will discover that the next address is going to be for Mix3. And then this goes on to Mix3. And then Mix3 is able to see that this message it, it should go on to Charlie, and so the message goes on to Charlie. 
So Mix1 sees a message coming in from Alice, but isn't able to see Charlie's address. Mix3 sees a message that's going to Charlie, but isn't able to see Alice's address. It just seems as if this message is coming from Mix1. So now we've got a separation of duty. Someone knows where you're coming from, a different person knows where you're going to, and as long as these two parties are not colluding, then you've got some reasonable degree of security. But if you're, let's suppose, just observing this whole network, suppose you see a message coming in from Alice, and then a message leaving the network for Charlie, another message coming in from Bob, and a message leaving for Dave, then you know that Alice is talking to Charlie and Bob is talking to Dave, just by looking at the timing of these messages. And this attack is known as a correlation attack, and Mixmaster incorporated some defenses against this. And the way it does that is, rather than taking in a message and then sending it out immediately, it takes in several messages, puts them as a batch, makes them, um, well, randomizes the order of them, and then send them out again. And here's a demonstration of one way that this can happen. So we've got one message coming in, another one, another one, order gets randomized, and then all three messages come out at the same time. So someone who's observing that mix is able to say that these three senders are talking to these three recipients, but isn't able to work out exactly who's communicating with who. So this is a good start, um, but it doesn't give you perfect security. And it also causes quite a long delay for messages going through remailers. It can take hours, if not days, for a message to go through the Mixmaster network. So some of the problems that were identified in Mixmaster were also solved in Mixminion. And in particular, it reintroduced one of the features I mentioned with the pennet.fi remailer, which is that you could now respond to email messages. With Mixmaster, it's a fire and forget. Your message goes through, maybe it's received, maybe it's not, maybe it got lost along the way. You're, you're never really sure. Uh, my experience, about half, me half of the messages you send never get to the destination for one reason or another. And then there's no way for the recipient to contact you again. Uh, on the other hand, Mixminion introduced the feature that when a message goes through, as you're unwrapping one set of layers of encryption, you're creating another set of layers of encryption, and then those can be used by the recipient of the email to send it back to the original. And now both parties can be anonymous from each other. But there's a, a big problem with Mixminion and all the other emailer systems, which is that the number of users of them is practically zero. So the Mixmaster network has got a handful of users. Mixminion um, basically doesn't work anymore because there's not enough interest in running it. And this is not good um, for your privacy because if someone is watching the entire network, they might see that there are five users at any one point in time. So no matter how secure the technology is, there's only five people in the list who have potentially sent this email. And so the security of this is negligible. And also, people don't use email anymore. People use Facebook, they use Gmail, um, they use apps and mobile phones. Basically, people are going to be using the web if they want to communicate. And the web is quite hard to secure when it comes to anonymity. I mentioned that things like Mixmaster and Mixminion will delay messages for hours, if not days. That would be intolerable for web browsing if every web page or every image on a web page took a day to appear. Also, because there's quite high variability in web traffic, sometimes you might be downloading a one by one pixel GIF, other times you might be downloading a CD. There's going to be sometimes very small transfers and sometimes very large transfers. What remailers do is that they try to pad all messages out to the same size, so you're not able to work out which incoming message corresponds to which outgoing message by the size. But if you padded every single image on the network to the same size as a 650 megabyte download, um, CD download, then 
you're going to also have a system that's entirely unusable. And that's why there's not really any way to feasibly pad messages so that they're all the same size on the web. But it's still possible to get anonymity on the web. In some ways, it's possible to get better anonymity because there are far, far more users. Even though there might be some way of reducing the number of possible senders of a particular message, hopefully the number of people that you started off with is going to be large enough that you're in a better situation than you were when it came to email. So there's a variety of different systems when it um, comes to anonymity on the web. The simplest one is open proxies. So you find a HTTP proxy somewhere out on the web and you send your communications via it. Sometimes these proxies are run by people who want to help prevent surveillance. Other times these are just servers that people have accidentally run and have been scanned and then included on some list. But they don't use any encryption, so someone who's looking at your communication will be able to see that you're going to a proxy and they'll be able to see what you're doing with this proxy. If you introduce encryption, like the, the type zero cypherpunk remailer, then you end up with a VPN. So someone can see you're using a VPN. They're not able to see the traffic that you're sending to the VPN because it's encrypted, but they are able to see how much you're sending. And in particular, the VPN operator is going to be um, in a good position to work out who's doing what. But if you now include all the security features that you can think of, and you have a design a bit like Mixed Minion, when you translate that to the web, you end up with something a bit like Tor. So here's a demonstration of how you send communications through the Tor network. There's a, a network of servers run by volunteers, about 5,000 of them today. And you as a Tor user have software on your computer, and it chooses three of these at random, the entry node, the middle node, and the exit node. You make an encrypted connection to the entry node. Over this encrypted connection, you make a connection to the middle node. And over that encrypted connection, you make a connection to the exit node. And now to this exit <coughs> node, you request where you want to go to, typically to another website. So this entry node knows who you are. The exit node knows where you're going. But as long as these two people are not cooperating, someone who is um, observing the network should have a hard time working out who's doing what. And that's the exact property that you want from an anonymous communication system. In a bit more detail, the way that the encryption works is that there is a link-by-link -link encryption layer, this outer tunnel that's implemented using TLS. And within that, there's another layer of encryption. So firstly, you create a TLS tunnel to the entry node. And then over this link, you make an encrypted connection using ephemeral Diffie-Hellman. And you've now got a key shared between yourself and the entry node. And all future communications are encrypted under this key. You then ask the entry node to connect to the middle node, do another key exchange. And then you connect to the exit node, and then do another key exchange. So the user has three keys, and each of the nodes has one key. When you want to send some data, you encrypt it under the first key, the second key, the third key. The message goes to the entry node. One layer of decryption is removed to, onto the middle node. Another layer of decryption is removed onto the exit node. The final layer of decryption is removed, and then it can go out onto the network. So the property that this has is someone observing the network will see different data at each stage because of the layer of encryption being removed or, in the case of replies, added at each stage. But the traffic patterns, so the amount of data sent over time, is going to stay approximately the same. And that's a consequence of Tor not being able to delay messages and not being able to pad messages. And that's the big weakness of things like Tor. If you're able to observe the entire internet, then you're able to work out who's communicating with who. But with a significant error rate. And 
we've now seen from the Snowden leaks that even the NSA, with all their capabilities, was having a hard time of carrying out this attack, at least in 2008. So probably this attack is going to be fairly tricky for the average criminal to be pulling off. So this is quite a, a popular tool. And one reason that people are very interested in anonymous communications is not just trying to hide what they're doing, but trying to bypass censorship. So one of the other projects that I worked on was the OpenNet Initiative. And what the OpenNet Initiative did was a survey of internet censorship across the world. And China is the country which has got the most pervasive internet censorship, but there are many more countries which are having an increasing amount of internet censorship. And if you want to bypass censorship, you need effectively anonymous communications because you need to hide what you're doing on the internet in order to prevent someone from discovering what you're doing and then blocking your access to that website. And the Tor project discovered that an increasing number of people only cared about their anonymity to the extent that it gave them the ability to bypass censorship. But censorship is not just a technical thing. It very commonly is implemented as rules on a firewall or dedicated blocking appliances, but some of it is also social. These are two little cartoon characters, um, Jing Jing and Cha Cha, from a Chinese website, and these pop up from time to time on this website, and they're dressed up as um, a policeman and a policewoman, and their goal is to remind you that you're being watched when you're on the internet. Even, and if you see something on the internet that you're concerned about, if you click on one of these characters, you'll be brought to an instant messenger chat with um, a policeman or a policewoman who will then help you report whatever you found, um, possibly get a website that uh, is not currently block blocked, um, possibly report on someone who is behaving contrary to the rules that you think they should comply with. And this is a very effective censorship technique. It means that even if your firewall cannot be 100% effective, people are intimidated. They know that they're being watched, they know that they're being surveilled, and if they step out of line, they're at risk of punishment um, through the legal system or worse. And therefore, you actually do need quite strong anonymity when you're using the internet for censorship resistance. It's not enough to just get through, it's necessary to also make sure that someone who is surveilling you isn't able to work out what you're doing. And as a result, lots of people in China use Tor. Here's a, a graph of the, the people who are using China, um, Tor in China. But you can see that there's some dips here. This is when China was experimenting with a system for blocking Tor. This was dedicated to blocking Tor. And it worked, but it probably had some issues, so it started working again. But at this point, China successfully blocked Tor based on fingerprinting the traffic, differentiating it from normal TLS traffic, and then blocking it. The other thing that China did was identified the list of all Tor servers and then blocking them by their IP address. And there's no way to hide the list of all the Tor servers because your client needs to know it in order to work out um, where it should be um, routing your traffic. So there is a, a new feature introduced to Tor called Bridges, which is intended to defeat this attack. This is an extra layer of Tor servers sitting in front of the network, but which are not publicly disclosed. You can get a few addresses of Bridges, but it shouldn't be possible for anyone to get all of the addresses of Bridges and then block them all. There was a variety of ways to get the bridge addresses, but this is the simplest using a website. So to stop someone getting all the bridge addresses, there is a captcha that you have to solve. Um, it's quite a tricky captcha, so the first time I tried it, I got it wrong. So it shows me another one. But the goal of this is to prevent automated harvesting of all the bridge addresses. But once you've got through, you get some 
bridge lines. If you want to connect Tor normally, you just press the connect button. If you're not censored, it will work fine. But if you are censored, you need to change the checkbox and then copy and paste the information that you get from the website. You could also get this via email or via social networks into the configuration settings of the, the Tor network um, control panel, and then you can connect. And after a few seconds, you'll be connected to the Tor network. It pops up a web browser, and then you can just browse as normal. And in this demonstration, I'm going to go to um, Google because Google internationalize their website. And this is the US version of Google. So the exit server in this case must have been um, uh, exit server in the US. So this has been relatively effective. We can see from the graphs that the number of Chinese users of bridges uh, went up dramatically when the rest of the network get, got blocked. But it's still not perfect. In particular, China managed to effectively block Tor bridges um, at this point. They tried a number of techniques, but the technique that worked the best for them is to actually scan all outgoing traffic from China. And they look for encrypted traffic. When they see encrypted traffic, they will then, a few minutes later, send a probe to the server that you connected um, to and then try to do a Tor network handshake. If you can do a network handshake, then they will conclude that this is a Tor server and they'll block it. They'll then continually probe this server until the Tor server stops and then they'll unblock it. So they're actually quite concerned about overblocking. They're, they're far better than many other organization when it comes to blacklisting websites or blacklisting servers. Um, this is why if you're looking at firewall logs or your computer logs, if someone connects to you from China for some legitimate reason, not long later, um, you might see um, an error message in your log. This is because it's trying to talk to your SSH server or your HTTPS server um, as if it was a Tor server. And therefore, this comes up as error if you're not using Tor. And they do this for every outgoing connection from China. So this was quite a lot of effort and quite a lot of equipment has been invested into blocking Tor. In order to try to defend against this and the other sorts of attacks that we're seeing against censorship resistant systems, there's a few open problems. One is trying to make network traffic not look like it's trying to bypass censorship. Currently, Tor looks a bit like TLS, but if it could be disguised as images over an unencrypted connection or disguised as voice over IP chat, it will be harder to block. The other open problem is how to resist the type of scanning that I mentioned. One way to do this is to not only give users an IP address of a bridge, but also give them the, um, a password that they need to have in order for the bridge to respond correctly. And this is already underway. And then the other one is, how do you distribute these bridge addresses and passwords to the users? So I gave a demonstration of the website. Um, this works in most countries. It doesn't work in China because the Chinese government have enough people to solve captures to reliably get all the bridge addresses that are distributed over the web. The other technique that works uh, in most countries is by um, sending an email from a Gmail address or a Yahoo address to bridges at torproject.org, and you'll get a response with a few IP addresses and passwords. Um, again, that doesn't work in China because they've got enough people to sign up to Gmail with as many addresses as they need. The technique that does work in China is um, distributing bridge addresses over social networks, sometimes online social networks, sometimes real world social networks but that doesn't scale as well as other opportunities. So there's more interest in trying to find better ways to solve these types of issues. Um, a, lot of work, uh, a lot of good work has happened here. Um, currently, China and all other countries does work 
when it comes to Tor, but it's a cat and mouse game. So China will find some way to block this sooner or later, and then the Tor project will need to come out with a way to bypass that blocking. So censorship is um, attacks from outside of the network, but there are also major problems of attacks within the network. There's plenty of various types of abuse on the internet, and Tor is no exception. And in fact, some people believe that anonymity causes people to behave badly. Um, I'm not sure whether that is true, but it's certainly true that a significant amount of traffic that is leaving the network is malicious, and as a result, people are finding ways of treating Tor traffic differently. Um, Google sometimes will do this. Um, if they see that you're connecting from Tor, they'll ask you to solve a captcha before you can continue. Um, this is probably because other people using the same IP address um, are using it to do some sort of searches for vulnerabilities on Google, which Google try to detect and then block. Um, the other type of network traffic that's problematic is Tor hidden services. So this is a, an extra feature built on top of Tor. It's the feature which gets the, the least amount of attention from users and developers and the most amount of attention from the press. It allows you to run a server without giving away your identity. And the way this works is you set up a server and then you choose a Tor node as your introduction point. Someone who wants to connect to you connects over Tor to um, these introduction points and then finds out the um, Tor network address, not the real IP address of the Tor hidden service, and then sets up something called a, a rendezvous point, connects to the rendezvous point, the, the web server also connects to this rendezvous point, and now Alice and Bob can communicate. Each of these green lines is a three hop Tor path. So Alice is anonymous from the rendezvous point, the rendezvous point is anonymous from Bob, and certainly Bob is anonymous from Alice, and vice versa. Some people use this just because they're behind NAT, and they want to run a server, and Tor hidden services work fine behind NAT, but other people run hidden services because they're hosting content that someone wants to block. Um, sometimes this is relatively innocuous by the sorts of standards in Europe. Um, other times it's illegal material in Europe and that's when the media and the police start getting interested. So because of all of this abuse, there is a, a limit to the, sustain, the sustainability of Tor because the network is run by volunteers and if volunteers are getting abuse complaints, then they might give up. So there's now some research that's been going on on how to prevent this abuse while still protecting the privacy of individuals. One technique for this, the, the simplest, um, is called Nimble. And what Nimble tries to do is anonymous blacklisting. For a variety of reasons, um, and certainly to protect the network itself, it should never be possible to de-anonymize someone who's using Tor or another anonymous communication system. But we can try to prevent them coming back again. So the way that, the way that Nimble works is you prove your identity to a Nimble server. This could involve you giving your IP address, um, it could involve you giving an email address, it could involve you showing your passport, or um, it could involve you paying money. And you now then, at that point, get uh, an anonymous identifier of this Nimble server. The Nimble server isn't able to know the corresponding identity behind one of these identities, uh, one of these Nimble identities, but it is able to see that this has been issued by a valid website and corresponds to a valid identity. So you then present this identifier to each of the websites that you're going to, and they're not able to work out who you are, but they are able to see that this is a valid identity and they should provide you service. They're also not able to link up the, your identity as you make repeated requests, because at each point you make a request 
you can change your identity in a way that only you are able to reverse. But now let's suppose that you did something bad, you vandalized a web page on Wikipedia, and someone spotted that. They can then um, send a message out to the Nimble server to say, in the future, never allow this person to connect again. And from that point on, you're no longer able to do this operation where you change your identity every time, and you're linkable um, from that point on, and people will not allow you to come back. So uh, this could be used in a website like Wikipedia, where if they detect abuse, they can make sure that you've got to get a, a new identity, which may, might cost some money, before you can do something again. But on the other hand, people who are willing to play by the rules are going to be fine, because their identity um, is going to be protected, and people are not going to be able to trace them back to their e original email address, and they will not be able to link together all the different things that they're doing. Then Nimble had a few issues. Uh, it wasn't quite efficient enough. It wasn't quite decentralized enough. So there was a, a large number of successors of, for this, but they all work on roughly the same principle. So uh, as I mentioned, abuse is one limit to Tor sustainability. But the other one is how do you actually run the Tor network? Um, this is the Tor financial report from 2011. These are the latest figures that I could find. And there, it was about one and a half million dollars to run the Tor network. Even when people were operating the servers and donating the bandwidth as volunteers, just keeping the software up to date, patching security vulnerabilities, improving scalability, cost a serious amount of money. And the vast majority of that was spent on, um, in charity terminology, program expenses. So all the things that I mentioned, um, and also providing user support. A relatively small amount was spent on fundraising and uh, management. In terms of where this money came from, the vast majority of this came from the US government. And this is somewhat problematic in that the US government has a fairly mixed view when it comes to internet freedom. If someone is supporting democracy somewhere else in the world, the parts of the US government will be very supportive. But if someone is using anonymous communication for leaking State Department cables, then the government is going to take a very different view. And so far, the US government funding received by TOR has been fairly good in that it hasn't come with any too problematic strings attached. But having all your funding from one organization is potentially an issue. And that's why there's a lot of interest now in trying to diversify the sources of funding in TOR. Um, that's one of the reasons that you can now donate to TOR using Bitcoin. The other question is, how do you cause people to donate network resources? So run these 5,000 Tor servers. You could um, pay people for running these servers, um, but then how do you get this money? Well, you could ask the users for money, but that doesn't always work because many users are not really going to be able to pay. The, these people might be human rights workers in some country without an easy way of sending money to the US. So even if they could afford, they weren't able to pay any money. And as a result, it's not feasible to charge anyone for using the network. In economics terms, this is known as the tragedy of the commons. If everyone shares a resource, then that resource gets depleted. One way that you could try to deal with this is by giving certain users better performance if they pay some money or they donate towards the network. But now if you're observing the network and you see that some people who's traffic is going faster, then they have now lost some of their anonymity. And the other risk is that if money is changing hand, then volunteers who are not receiving any money might give up at that stage. Um, there was a, a story about a nursery school in Israel where they had a problem with parents showing up to, late to collect their children. So the nursery decided to um, find parents who were showing up late and then they discovered that parents showed up later. Even more parents were showing up late because they thought that by paying this fine, they were um, paying for extra services. And then for many people, paying a fine is, is um, perfectly affordable. So the nursery 
what got worried about this, so they cancelled the fine, and then the parents didn't get any earlier. They stayed being late. So introducing money into a system can make it worse in a way that's very hard to recover from, and that's why this sort of step has not been taken by the Tor project yet. But the other way to try to um, preserve sustainability is trying to get more people to contribute to the network. Um, if you're interested in Tor and you've got a server that you can run, then please talk to me afterwards um, if you want to um, some help on where to get started to. If you can write code, you can have a look on the website for various tasks that, that need to be done. Um, and if you haven't already done so, why don't you download Tor, try it, and then promote it to your friends? Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Stephen. Um, before coffee, we've probably got time for a, a few questions. So, any questions for Stephen at all, please? Uh, you showed the map saying the planet is the biggest one for. Yes. Yes. Um, so the, the project looked at um, most of the countries where it was safe to do so. So in, in North Korea, it was not safe to do monitoring there. But we know from people who've left it that they've essentially connected, disconnected themselves from the internet. Um, what they do is they copy websites that they like onto the private network. And it's only the very rich people who have access to this private network. Um, countries like um, Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan are a little bit less strict, but not very much. Um, and then China is the, the largest and most complex, but probably not the one that censors the most. They are the most sophisticated. Okay. I've got a question. You know, compared with the remailers and with the Tor network. Yeah. And my question was, those remailers, they solve the problem with message level security. They try to get the message from one person to another person mm -hmm. um, with anonymity. But I saw from the Tor network, this is more, more or less on tra transport level, not on message level. Yes. Is there any work to mix those two things so that you really can have an end-to-end -end secure anonymous communication without some servers in between which are still able to look in my clear mail, for example? Um, so th there are some in special cases. So there's uh, broadcast systems. So you can send your message to everyone and then only the right person is able to decrypt it. And then you don't need to have some trustworthy servers in between. Um, but all the schemes I've seen where um, it's not a broadcast system, there does have to be some servers in between you, but hopefully um, not all of these are working together, and provided at least some of them are honest and the network is working properly, then your privacy should be protected. <laughs> all right. um, have you done any analysis into um the use of Tor within the US itself, within its own borders? Uh, so there are quite a lot of metrics on how Tor is being used, but these have to be collected very carefully to make sure these statistics don't violate people's um, privacy in themselves. So uh, there is an approximate number of users within the US, so it's, it's quite substantial. Basically, Tor usage tracks internet usage um, unless something special is going on in the country. Oh. Um, but we don't know what they're doing. There is some currently um, being developed research on trying to safely measure what people are using Tor for. But that will not be broken down by country because the only people who know what you're using Tor for is the exit nodes and they don't know where you're coming from. Yeah, okay, thanks. Any other questions for Stephen at all? Uh, how confident are you that you'll be able to get uh, protocol obfuscation actually working well? Because presumably 
unless you have some traffic in the clay coming from your uh, origin point, then it'll be obvious to anyone surveying that you're using a, uh, a system such as Tor. Yeah, there's, um, this is a matter of quite a lot of debate. The, there's a paper called The Parrot is Dead um, uh, by Vitaly Shmatikov, which claims that it is impossible to impersonate um, another protocol. And the reason is because there's lots of edge cases and protocols that are very hard to copy. So you can have something that Wireshark will think is exactly the same as another protocol, but if you then start probing it and send it some invalid packets, packets then it's going to look quite a bit different. Um, and one way of trying to defend against that is to use the real implementation. Um, and rather than trying to impersonate it, just be that implementation. So one example is um, a censorship resistance system called Meek, which plugs into Tor. And then you use Firefox co to connect to Meek. Meek then connects to the, your Tor server, does all the Tor stuff, but then sends it back to Firefox. Firefox then connects out to your Tor bridge and talks HTTPS. And someone who's looking at this traffic will think that this is HTTPS, and they'll think it's coming from Firefox because it is coming from Firefox. But within this HTTPS, there's HTTP, and then within that is Tor network traffic. So that goes quite a long way to try to impersonate protocols. The downside of this approach is that the size of the content does not look very typical. Um, everything is a multiple of 568 bytes, and that's a bit unusual. So there's more work going on on trying to hide patterns like that. Um, the other option is try to make things look a bit like plain text. And even though you've got encrypted text, that has high entropy. The other thing that has high entropy is compressed data. So provided someone is not looking too closely, you can disguise encrypted data in a place where compressed data belongs, like in the body of an image. I know it is hard to make predictions about the future and about the internet, but what are your realistic expectations about the future of Tor? Um, I think the network is going to grow. Um, there are, there's good reason to believe it can grow by another order of magnitude and still be working correctly. But at that point, it starts to become a bit uncertain as to what's going to happen. Uh, I think the Tor project's doing pretty well, so it probably will exist. But I think the Tor network architecture is going to have to change. And the change that I think is going to have to happen is that it will be a more peer-to-peer -peer network than it is today. Currently, every client knows about every possible Tor server. That's fine when there's 5,000. It's probably fine when there's 50,000. When there's 500,000 and there's high churn, then this starts to become a bit harder to deal with. And I think what will happen then is that users will only know about a part of the, the new to our network. But that is very hard to deal with securely because once you know only about some of the network, then you are distinctive from the other people. When you move to another part of the internet and then you connect your same little bit of the Tor network, then you are um, going to be distinguishable from someone who's connecting to a different part of the Tor network. And I think that's probably the, the biggest area of research on how Tor is going to grow, basically how to become sustainable and how to scale to internet size. Just a round of applause for Stephen. Thank you very much.